Hi, I'm Ed Whittingham, and you're listening to Energy vs. Climate, the show where my co-hosts David Keith, Sarah Hastings Simon, and I debate today's energy challenges, highlighting the Albertan and Canadian context. If this is your first time joining us, Energy vs. Climate is a live webinar and podcast that drops every other week. Visit energyversusclimate.com to register for updates and get exclusive access to join our live webinars, ask us questions, and engage with us directly. On today's show, if you worry about climate change, as I imagine we all do, we've had some discouraging news of late. Earlier this week, we got a comprehensive new report from the United Nations, the second part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 6 Assessment Report, that prompted headlines like, Half of Humanity at Risk from Impacts of Climate Change, and Delay Means Death. In fact, our guest today was one of the authors of that IPCC report. In Washington, President Biden's ambitious climate legislation has been all but killed by unanimous Republican opposition and the Democratic senator from the coal-producing state of West Virginia, Joe Manchin, who is heavily supported by the fossil fuel industry. Lastly, we know that what Russia is doing to Ukraine is awful, despicable, and likely criminal. It's also laying bare Europe's economic reliance on Russian fossil fuels like natural gas, and, as humanitarian crises do, it's drawing time and attention away from long-term crises like climate change. So it feels like we could use some encouraging news for a change. Well, look no further than the stunning evolution of solar power. The cost of solar power has decreased by a factor of 1,000 over the last 50 years, and by a factor of 10,000 since it was first used to power a satellite in the mid-1950s. In some sunny regions, solar is now the cheapest energy available, cheaper than fossil fuel competitors. Today, we're going to unpack solar's multi-decade cost curve decline to see if there are any lessons applicable to other forms of climate tech, like energy storage and carbon capture. To help us, we've enlisted Dr. Gregory Nemet, as he literally wrote the book on the topic a couple of years ago, called How Solar Energy Became Cheap, a Model for Low-Carbon Innovation. Greg is a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in its LaFollette School of Public Affairs, where his research focuses on understanding the process of tech change and the ways in which public policy affects it. Greg was named an Andrew Carnegie Fellow in 2017. He was awarded the inaugural World Citizen Prize in Environmental Performance, by the Association for Public Policy and Analysis in 2019, and as I mentioned earlier, he is lead author for the IPCC's sixth assessment report. Like Greg's book, I think we managed to make a discussion of tech cost curve declines lively and accessible. I hope you do too. Now on to the show. So let's start things off with this week's energy versus climate news and not news segment. And I think we can't help but focus on the climate and energy implications of the war in Ukraine. Uh, David, Sarah, uh, who wants to start? Go for it, David. Well, um, starting maybe a a little bit with the personal, I taught uh, two classes today. I taught an extra class, uh, Megan O'Sullivan's global energy uh, class, because she herself, as is now public, was asked by the White House to fly to um, Taiwan and talk to the... um, Prime Minister of Taiwan to give them some uh, comfort about the U.S. point of view. She was a unusually for the Kennedy School, a, a Republican, was on Bush's National Security Council, is very trusted in these matters, and and so it's 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 impossible not to think about just how quickly these implications are spreading. And maybe just on a personal note to say, I I um, visited many of those cities that we're hearing about now in the 1976 with my Jewish grandmother. Her, her parents had come from there, and we actually visited that. Uh, Memorial to the this Jewish massacre at Baba Yag, um, um, that the Russians just bombed. So it's it's there's no getting out of the fact that it's pretty real, and I think that the consequences for um, spending on energy and climate are um, unclear. But I think it's easy to construct arguments that while this will have some benefits and maybe pushing renewables faster in uh, Europe, it will push attention away from energy and climate as you know maybe you saw in the state of the union and less you get sort of too excited about the way that some of these kind of spending uh, post a crisis can help there was a i thought a very interesting paper that came out in the commentary section of nature in the last couple of days from uh, upalainen and colleagues 
that totaled up the fraction of the total global kind of build back better, that's the US phrase, but the COVID spending that uh, was related to emissions re reductions. And their overall estimate is 6%. And the, in many ways, that actually may be charitable. And two countries that are relevant to, to this conversation, Canada and the US, uh, 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 US showed basically no change. Canada uh, actually showed some change, a reduction in emissions uh, uh, spending. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, you know, I, I find it hard to almost comment on the implications right now, because I mean, you know, we're in the middle of a war and and that sort of overshadows, I think, everything when it comes to what what this means right now. Um, you know, that that said, I guess if we start to look ahead in the coming, you know, months to a year and, and what might happen afterwards, there certainly are signs of uh, action that's moving ahead, right? So the IEA in particular released a plan today that they believe would put Europe on a path to reduce Russian gas imports by somewhere around a half, um, uh, up to a half to a third, something like that over the next year. You know, I think that's pretty significant in the sense that, you know, if you could put together a plan plan that gets you halfway, you know, you're, you're sort of close to a plan that gets you all the way there. Um, and that's really a mix of, you know, what one would expect to see. So imports from other places, but also really ramping up installation of heat pumps and efficiency uh, and, and uh, new generation, um, renewable energy generation on the electricity side. So I think there'll be, you know, actions that's taken in the, in the sort of medium term. I did also go back just to sort of remind myself, um, having having not lived through it like some of my co-hosts might have, uh, the oil embargo experience and what happened in the period following that. Oh, that's um, a dig about age. <laughs> yes, I do remember the gas lines in 1973, damn you. Maybe don't David lived through it, but we just don't remember it, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I, I'm far from an expert here, I mean, other people have, have written much more about it, but one of the things that struck me in looking at this, uh, in this case, EIA report that came out, I think it was about 25 years after that, um, after that crisis was, you know, that short term stuff is quite short term, but it did really uh, follow a, a relatively long, you know, 20 year period of some pretty dramatic changes in the energy system in various ways. So, you know, the, the consumption of oil, barrels of oil per person in the U.S., for example, dropped uh, from where it was in 1972 and has actually never recovered as high. I, I was surprised by that. I actually checked it again because I was like, that can't be true. We must be using more now. Um, some of the energy efficiency measures also, you know, the the, ener the efficiency of fridges got at like 3,000 percent or three times more efficient. So, you know, I think there is the, the extent to which dramatic effects can really spur policy policymakers to take big action, I think is something that we've seen before. And so I do expect that, you know, in the period coming out of, say, a year following where, you know, you're still very much in crisis mode, we could see acceleration of some of these trends as a result. Yeah. And I've been encouraged. It, it, it's great that that uh, energy strategy aimed at weaning the EU, the continent off Russian gas is really getting some legs now. What I worry about is what we're acknowledging in the short term is that the EU, if you want to get off Russian gas, you can implement these measures. They take time. They're going to need imports of liquefied natural gas, principally from the United States, to make up some of that shortfall. And one, uh, this going back to 2014, around the time when uh, Russia was annexing uh, Crimea, I was at a World Economic Forum event uh, in Dubai. And at the time, I chalked this up to conspiracy theorist lunacy. But I remember people talking then about, one, the West encroaching uh, on uh, Russia's sphere of influence and sort of the, the powder keg-like aspect of that. But two, the conspiracy theorists were saying, this could be a catalyst to create a new off-take market, off market for U.S. natural gas. And so what we're actually seeing now is genuinely, you know, looking at U.S. LNG exports as a substitute. And if you lock that in, then how much is that actually going to depress the EU's longer term strategy to get off gas through efficiency and through other measures? So I worry about that. Yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead, Greg. Well, I was just going to chime in. Yeah, you know, for my for me, the first impression is, as you've mentioned, it's just tremendous human suffering. But then the second is this really does have, as Sarah mentioned, the potential to be seen as a focusing event. So something that people don't forget about and that 
potentially create some kind of consensus. And that's one of the rare times on energy policy in some of the ways that Sarah mentioned that we had consensus because right and left bipartisan multiple countries, there was this idea we need to get more efficient. We needed to get off of foreign oil. And a lot of investment followed, a lot of really serious policies followed, including you know doubling the fuel efficiency of cars. That has the potential to happen again, but it's not clear what direction that goes in. So we often talk about wanting energy that's cheap, that's clean and reliable. And if we're thinking about climate change, that clean part has been you know really important. If we're thinking about the current crisis, what Europe's really focused on is reliability and how that connects to geopolitics. And so whether the solutions that address reliability, which it certainly is going to be Europe's number one focus for potentially years to come, does that align with climate and clean or does that diverge in, in different directions? I think that part is still still to come, but I do think there's going to be lasting impact from from these events. And, and certainly in the short term, Greg, the, the cheap part isn't playing out with the fossils because I was talking to someone in Vancouver just this morning. They're paying a buck eighty nine per liter for gasoline, in part because this crisis is just jacking the prices of oil and natural gas through the roof when at a time they're already going up. Right. Yeah, I think one one other thing for me that I take away from it is just in general, you know, energy security and reliable, affordable energy is is challenging, right? Whether it's produced by uh, fossil sources or, you know, the challenges that we'll have to overcome to, to decarbonize the energy system, right? And I think that that's, you know, there, there are going to be different kinds of challenges, but it's not as if the system that we have now or have historically, uh, you know, functions without, uh, without issue. Yeah. You know, Greg, I, I'd love to hear your commentary, because you were a lead author on that sixth assessment report, the second part of which came out earlier this week. I'd mentioned some of the headlines and it triggered. There's lots in there, but I can only imagine that it was completely overshadowed by you know, the, the war in Ukraine right now. It was. And, you know, in a way, it's maybe fortunate because that's the bad news report. That's like, how bad will climate change be? I'm working on the next report, which comes out in early April about what are the solutions, which could be seen as a more optimistic side of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work in those reports and a lot of focus to say when that report comes out, there'll be a lot of tension on this topic. And there was last summer when the first report came out. Um, but yeah, that's not happening right now for good reasons. There's, there's focus in other areas. So, you know, I think that's the other side of a focusing event is it takes away it really puts focus on one area. I mean, we saw that in the U.S. after 9-11, where it's tremendous resources, tremendous public attention uh, into terrorism and security and, and related issues. And that is another thing that energy always has to deal with, is there's always going to be competing social priorities. And that's a big challenge when we're talking about a system that's slow to change, a climate system that's slow to respond to our efforts to make it better. And so, yeah, I think that's going to be continuing an issue is how do you make sure climate change gets the public attention it needs when there's always going to be competing priorities. And this is an extreme example, but, you know, not, not uh, uh, infrequent that other things will come up. Yeah. Yeah. And think about the opportunity cost of focusing on the war on terror for a couple of decades when perhaps we should have been anticipating war in Eastern Europe a little mm -hmm. bit more. Anyway, so we've spent a bit more time on this. It's obviously important. We're paying lots of attention. And it is personal. We've all got connections. I, I was in touch with a former colleague of mine and of Sarah's at the Pemmon Institute, who's uh, thankfully uh, family is safe right now, but has close friends that are, are huddling in the underground in Kiev, uh, worried desperately for their safety and security. So obviously our, our hearts go out to them and we all hope for really quick resolution to, to the war there. Let's Let's pivot to the good news side, the encouraging news side of what we want to talk about today, and that is the focus of Greg's research. So, Greg, I uh, want to spend a bit of time just getting you to unpack your research, but why don't we begin because you were working for a think tank in Silicon Valley back in the heady dot-com days of the late 1990s, and then you initiated graduate studies to understand how energy innovation could be better incentivized? Maybe you could sort of patch those two together. How did you get to that focus in your graduate studies? Yeah. I, and I did geography undergrad. So I took a course in energy and another course in meteorology and climate change. And so those are kind of on the radar. Um, but I moved in different directions after 
I graduated, did management consulting. Yeah, worked at a, a healthcare.com in the late 1990s in Silicon Valley and kind of saw the startup culture. Then worked at a think tank on Sand Hill Road for a couple of years. One report we did in the think tank was we looked at innovation in different sectors, like comparing consumer products, information technology, and healthcare, and looking at things like R&D spending, number of scientists and engineers patenting, and some of the outcomes. And then we threw in energy as a fourth category just to compare it. And it was just dramatic to me that on every indicator, energy was like an order of magnitude less in terms of investment, R&D spending, people working in the area. And it just didn't really seem to make sense given the issues that were at stake there. So yeah, I, I went to uh, Berkeley and Energy and Resources Group and started studying this question that I, I still work on today is how do we stimulate innovation in low carbon energy technologies? And you know, one of the ones that first came up um, was solar. And it, it really wasn't because there was an implication that solar was going to be the future. It was just more that solar was changing a lot. And it was one that had a steep learning curve. And we could talk about that. Um, so that was the reason for the focus on solar. It just seemed like it was dynamic and something to study. Even at the time, it wasn't something that people would take seriously for addressing energy problems. Great. Uh, so you decided to focus on the solar side of energy. And as I'd mentioned off the top, it had this stunning decrease in, in cost, sort of 10,000 fold from when it was first used in the mid 1950s, a thousand fold in the last five decades. So maybe now tie in your research that led to the book, How Solar Energy Became Cheap, and then walk us through a little bit, maybe unpack for us a bit more on that, that severe cost curve decline. How did it happen? It obviously wasn't a straight shot. And then we'll pivot into why it happened. Yeah. Well, so I guess one thing I would say is that, you know, I was working on that question for quite a while. I, I spent a summer in Austria, a great place, of unpacking some of the reasons for the cost reductions and trying to estimate the different factors and did kind of engineering based models and econometric models. And, you know, those all kind of added some insight, but I really did have the feeling after a few years of working on that, that there was more to the story than those models were revealing. Uh, and so the idea there was to take, uh, add a qualitative aspect to the quantitative work and talk to people and also to talk to people, not in one place, but in many places. And I think that was something that, you know, you mentioned that uh, uh, funding that I got to, to, to have the, the resources and the time to travel and go listen to people in many different places and put it all together was just, I don't know, that was one of my favorite things I've done in my career because I feel like you learn so much and especially a story like this, where it's so easy just to say, let's look at Germany or let's look at Denmark for wind or look at Japan for batteries or whatever it is. You want to go deep in that place and understand it. But in the solar case, it really was these international linkages and it was you know partially trade and things like that a lot of it was just people moving around like going from one country to another having kind of idiosyncratic connections to different places hunting around for used parts to do a startup in china so those types of kind of international mobility was a really big part uh, of the solar story and so that's kind of where my research wanted to try to understand kind of qualitatively and get some of these stories from some of the participants that were involved in the different stages and, and tell us just about the research you went and I think you had 75 interviews spanning 18 countries. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Tried to talk to lots of people. Um, and you know, a lot of it was trying to get, you know, there was one person I talked to that was kind of a, a persona non grata in China because he was the richest person in China for three years. And then things turned because they bought a company that had a lot of debt and things went the other way. And, you know, being able to talked to him that took a little bit of while and hanging out and spending time kind of cooling my heels, waiting till, uh, till it were turned out and then getting the story about like how he set up the first factory and how the first three or four years went, um, was, you know, I hadn't seen that anywhere else. And, but it was such an important point of trying to understand, like, how do these things go from being scientific ideas or just novelties or, um, things that people think might be a good idea to someone actually starting to build stuff and raising the money to do it and finding customers, maybe customers in a different country and then making that all work. And I think that was, yeah, revealing to me and I think instructive for how we might think of other um, technologies that might be helpful as well. Which like is, 
yeah, chime in with an anecdote about how surprising it was. I'm sure you know this paper, Greg. I always find it exciting to be just totally wrong. <laughs> so this group I was at it with Carnegie Mellon did all these papers of so-called expert judgment surveys where we'd interview people on this paper that Amy Curtwright was lead on, and I'm sure you know, yeah. that data was gathered in 07. And we talked to a bunch of people who seemed to be experts in solar technology. And uh, um, we asked them the probability of getting module prices to uh, under 30 cents a watt by 2030. Uh, just look at the data again right now. And basically, they mostly put the probabilities at near zero. Well, no chance of getting that cheap in 2030. And we're basically there now, and it's not 2030 yet. So it's can, it, it, it's just stunning to me how wrong. And these were, we didn't, we asked people who were at the forefront of solar R&D. And, and I, actually on that, Greg, because I know in your book, you talk about how the cost curve decline kind of took a pause, a hiatus in 2004 into the late 2000s. And it had to do with the silicon avail the availability of silicon, and that you had that <laughs> the solar industry was basically hoovering up excess silicon put out by the tech industry at cheap prices. But then, because of the growth in German policies at that point, there was such a rush on silicon that it couldn't just hoover up the leftovers. It had to go and source it, and then as a result, then silicon prices went up, and it took five years to sort that out. Maybe I've told the story, but I'm sure you could add a lot more color as something that would have been very difficult to predict at the time. Yeah, I mean, difficult to predict as David just described. And as he said, those are experts in the industry. And not only they know a lot about the industry, they might also have motivational bias to be optimistic. That's why they're in the industry. And yet they were all wrong. They're all too pessimistic. Exactly. And it's it's really shocking. Um, but you know, one thing that you see with that is there has been this steady decline in costs that kind of aligns with this idea of a learning curve. Um, but there can be perturbations on that for the same reasons that, you know, last year, two by fours got really expensive and then they started becoming less expensive as supply chains were, uh, were expanded and we were availability uh, grew. And that was the same thing with solar. It's the same thing with other commodities as well. So we do have these cycles of boom and bust. And in case of solar, it was driven a lot by policy. Like you said, that German policy in the mid 2000s, all of a sudden the German market expanded, the biggest market in the world expanded by a factor of four. And that was great, but it did make it hard to source parts and materials just like it is today with a lot of things. And that made the cost go up. And we're actually even seeing that today in 2022 or 2021 data with solar and also with uh, lithium ion battery packs for electric vehicles as the costs have gone up, not a lot, but on the order of 10 to 20% in the last uh, year or so for some of those same reasons. And I get a lot of comments that are similar to what you were saying that people were saying in 2005, 2006, and probably maybe what respondents to David's survey were thinking about as well is that maybe we hit the end of the learning curve, maybe batteries are got to the end of it because we're running out of cobalt or whatever it is. Um, but I just, I feel like I'm much more optimistic about this long-term cost decline for batteries because it looks so much like solar. And similarly for solar is that you work around those bottlenecks, maybe you substitute different materials, you expand the supply for things that are constrained right now. And there's still room to run on both of those. But it's good to, to think about of people being wrong and also can be wrong by being pessimistic, even experts. Um, but then also that we do have these kind of short-term supply chain issues that could raise prices, even if the long-term trajectory is downward and getting cheaper. Ed, maybe just one thought on that. I mean, I think, you know, in Alberta, there's um, often when people are thinking about costs of energy technologies, they are using sort of learning or knowledge that comes from uh, fossil fuel production. And that's where I see one big difference, right? When we talk about, Greg, you were mentioning the potential for sort of these short term or these supply chain disruptions that can increase costs, say, over a short period of time. Um, but there's this underlying fundamental driver of, you know, the challenge in the in producing, say, oil, is that you, on the one hand, are improving your technology, but you are fundamentally draining your resources at a pace that is very different, I think, from the pace that we're talking about, um, you know, the scale of availability of something like cobalt, where, you know, yes, there, you know, it, it's 
we may need to end up producing more or lithium or whatever it is, but the um, the available reserves are at a very different scale than say, um, you know, what's happened to the cost of oil where your technology improves, but then you really are actually running through the lower cost production that you have. And so I think that to me a little bit explains this difference or the ability for some of these other energy technologies to continue on relatively steeper cost declines because, you know, fundamentally the input of the sun obviously is, is not going away, at least on our, on our life scales. Um, whereas when you talk about the, you know, non-renewable resources, you are facing depletion. And I think that distinction is actually quite important. Yeah. I'd, so I'd like to, I'd like to go there in our discussion. It seems to me that energy technologies have long learning curves. You look at the oil sands, the oil sands took decades and decades to figure out for it to actually be cost competitive. And some would argue now that in a world, even though the price is high, we're awash with cheap oil and low carbon oil, oil sands oil won't be competitive not too long from now. With solar, uh, it, when I look at it, it's basically an 80 year trajectory. Whereas you contrast that, say, with micro, micro chips and, and Moore's law, where you have incredible gains in a half decade. So, but the, the, the problem that we faced with the climate problem is we can't wait until 2080 for, say, the, uh, the cost curve of direct air capture carbon removal technology to hit such a point where they can then start to be widely deployed. And then they're not widely adopted by 2100. We have to accelerate that. So, Greg, going back to you in your research, what lessons can we learn from solar and then apply that to other low carbon technologies without having to wait for that cost curve to play out over 80 years? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I mean, that was really a motivation for writing this book too, is just, you know, understand solar, but why? Because we want to use the success. Like that's, we don't often have something so successful as a model that we can apply, but you're right. It was too slow. We can't just take that and, and map it on. So a couple sources of encouragement. So one is, there's another technology that's also helpful for low carbon energy, uh, batteries for electric vehicles. And they seem to be going faster than solar did from kind of development of the technology to early applications to widespread applications. So I was just looking up last night. So the number of electric vehicles on the road is increased by, it was like a factor of 200 or so over the last 10 years. So we're talking about very rapid growth in adoption there and also a learning curve. So the costs of batteries have come down. So batteries that, you know, today cost something like maybe $10,000 or f maybe $5,000 in a small car were 10 times that. So you'd like 50,000 or $60,000 just for the batteries in a car 10 years ago. So that's dramatic. That makes a big difference. And the reasons for it are a lot of the same reasons as solar. So the small modular design where you can take advantage of other markets that were already there, like markets for portable electronics, like laptops and phones, and just string together more and more of the exact same thing. The technology's mature. We don't have to hem and haw too much about which is the right material to use. Let's just keep making more of the same thing and find ways to do it on a bigger scale and faster, introduce automation, use a lot of specialized machinery. There's not a lot of risk because we know how the materials work and how long they last. So, you know, batteries looks very similar to solar, but has happening much more quickly and a potentially huge market and could make a, a big difference as well. So that's, that's encouraging, uh, especially because it had, uses a lot of the same mechanisms that solar got cheap with. Then there's other things that have happened that kind of worked in a different way, um, but maybe have some less direct lessons to apply. So if we think about developing a vaccine for COVID. So that also happened at exactly the same ratio that we need for solar. So if we need, or for future technology. So if we need to go from an 80 year development timeline to 20, the fastest vaccine developed ever was for measles. And that took four years. And then last year we did it in one and it's different, you know, the smaller technology and it's biomedical. And so it's, it's really different, but there were things that made it work. There was fundamental science that had been brewing for 20 years and there was a breakthrough with mrna and then crucially at the time that we thought we might need a vaccine government stepped in with commitments to purchase and so the idea of scaling up testing doing clinical trials which takes years normally could happen a lot faster because there was a guaranteed return if it was successful and so that's you know 
different technology. So it's not like using lots of battery packs, like lots of little solar panels, but it is similar in terms of the policies, combination of science, R&D and technology push, and then creating markets that created certainty that took away the risk. There's always risk with a new technology that people will be averse to. And in this case, government can reduce some of that risk by guaranteeing uh, markets. And in this case, you know, on the level of tens of billions of dollars. So a large investment, but relative to the cost of a pandemic, really a, a drop in the ocean. And so a smart investment to do. And so I would think for other technologies that maybe can't use the solar model, this con- focus on making sure there's a market, because if there is a market, a uh, lot of investment and innovation follows. The COVID example is a good one, and we should acknowledge there is also one accelerant that was present that isn't present in energy technologies, and that is short-term fear for human health and safety, getting to our earlier discussion about short-term crises versus long-term ones. I'd, I'd love to unpack a bit more about modularity and its importance. And for our audience, you know, the smaller you have, uh, the smaller a technology the shorter the time capital stock turnover. So our phones, you know, turn over, we're, we're replacing our phones every few years these days, and that creates a catalyst for producers to keep improving the technology. Our cars are more on the time scale of a decade. I mean, David, to put you on the spot, you dealt with this back in your founding days of carbon engineering, when thinking of, are you going to take a small scale approach like another carbon removal company has done versus a large scale approach. How important is modularity in really decreasing that cost curve? And our nuclear plans, the example of having something really big that doesn't learn or actually has a negative learning rate and just gets more expensive over time. I think it's important. So as, as Greg knows really well, these learning rates really get misused. There's a combination of economies of scale of supply chain effects and of actual learning that could fold together to make these so-called experience curves. I think it's really worth picking apart the factors because there's lots of places where we don't see as rapid change. I think there's some particular reasons why solar's fast and other things weren't so fast. So um, complicated technologies, I don't don't think it's really just about size, Ed. Um, uh, Screws or nails are quite small, smaller than cell phones, and we don't see those dramatic uh, uh, changes. So it's not about the size. It's about the level of parts and complexity. This is stuff that Jessica Transick's group, I think, has really done some nice thinking about, about the complexity of supply chain leading in and about where you're doing the mass production. But I think it's interesting that there have been lots of things we produced at really large scales where we see very little learning over time and other things where we see rapid. Uh, I think one example, I think it's important to think about some, some, some important physical differentiators. Solar cells are fundamentally a surface physics phenomenon. It's all about the surface. You make the surface pure, you treat it a little better, and you drive the cost down. It's not a bulk process. And I think that's part of the reason it was able to get that big leverage. Part of the reason we have even faster leverage for IT is because IT is a printing technology where, where you've got, you're, you're going as the square because when you shrink the dimensions by half, you increase the parts count by four in two dimensions. So I think there are some real reasons why you shouldn't expect that for other things. I don't think batteries will go like solar, and I don't think the evidence of the last few years are that they are. And part of that is that especially if you're looking at the per kilowatt hour cost as opposed to the kil- kilowatt cost, that is ultimately about bulk. And the bulk processing technologies are these kind of chemical engineering technologies, which according to the kind of research that Jessica and others have shown, I think we don't expect to decline that quickly. So for the answers for carbon engineering, we think modularity is crucial, which is why uh, uh, we want to both start cheap and be modular. So the aqueous contactor is inherently really a modular production, and it starts really cheap, which is why we think we have a pathway to do the cheapest thing. And I think that's an interesting combination too, or if you think about a large scale technology, like one of those direct air capture facilities, but having modularity within that that there's many, many contactors that have this modular aspect of them. Maybe you get a bit of economies of scale where you need it. And then that, the modularity. Works. That to me is why we think we're better off than our competitors because, because there's, you want to be, you want to have the modularity exactly where you want it. So there's a reason why people don't make big pumps or cooling equipment in this millions of little module ways. So the air contactor wants to be module, yeah. modular. But the gas handling cleanup it doesn't want to be modular because those are technologies where we don't see people aren't making commercial oil refineries that refine a barrel a day. 
right. uh, or biofuel refineries or the, the, the materials that process the chemicals that make batteries. Those all want to be big. And so those are where the chemical engineering power laws matter. And you really need to think about which of these you're in to figure out how you want to win. So we did think about that a lot for carbon engineering. And we thought about the different kinds of, uh, of things that control costs and want to get the best of both worlds. I think the modularity is also, um, I would just add that th there's even more benefits in being able to come down the cost curve faster, the more modular you are because of the less quantity of money it takes to bite off, you know, a certain chunk of number of, of units that you produce, right? And so, you know, I actually went back actually to, to that one of the papers, Dave, that you mentioned from, from Jessica. Um, and you know, one of the things that, that I saw there was like in the early years so leading up to the 2000s, it was really the R&D and efficiency improvements that were responsible for a lot of the cost decline. So, you know, getting better at the sort of maybe not quite physics, but that more that closer side or engineering side of it, but that post 2000s and in that really more aggressive period of cost declines, it really was the economies of scale and, you know, just the plant size of these things. And so the idea that uh, technology that is more modular, it's just simply you know, we go back to sort of the German story and this idea that there were countries that were willing to step up and say, well, we are going to invest, you know, some significant chunk of money in order to help come down the cost curve by producing, you know, the next order of magnitude of uh, widgets, whatever those widgets are. That's, of course, you know, much easier to do if those widgets each are, you know, a thousand times or more or less expensive. And I think to me, that's one of the challenges that I see with carbon capture and storage and in particular, bringing it back home to Alberta. You know, obviously, we have a lot of uh, the knowledge and engineering ability here. But what I've never been able to wrap my head around is like the scale of funding that the province of Alberta and even, frankly, the the country of Canada could devote to uh, to, to um, you know getting cost reductions in CCS through a sort of economies of scale or, you know, number of units argument. Um, it, it's hard to fathom that amount of money really being directed by that country, by, you know, by our country alone, it, it would be more. And I think that's one of the big challenges. You know, if you look at the, um, the story of the oil sands and the SAG-D technology, that was also big, you know, really big technology. Um, but it just, it didn't take very many, certainly much less orders of magnitude of, of units than the solar production to kind of come down that curve. And, and part of it was actually some of the early demonstrations um, actually had higher efficiencies than people were expecting. So, you know, notwithstanding a lot of the engineering work that had to happen in order to, to um, get there, it was, uh, it was easier. Um, yeah. One one other thought, so one other example on the faster side, I think the case of LEDs and, and LED lighting is a really interesting one, right? There you have like the fundamental physics prize, uh, Nobel Prize being awarded for the blue light, which is of course part of the white light that we have in our bulbs um, in the 90s, right? And you went from that period of the fundamental physics to, you know, it's that that's sort of the standard almost now LED lighting. Um, and I do think that there and in the example of solar and potential others, that ability to piggyback off of other existing industries yeah. is really key. Right. And, and so the idea that solar could hoover up that uh, silicon supply from the tech industry, that it was both cheap to start, but they also they just didn't have to go and like build that whole thing. They could just take and use that part. And so that's another metric. You know, that's that's one reason that I'm excited about some of these ideas of like long term thermal storage, because where you can put together pieces from existing industries, um, you know, it, it is you have fewer things to solve when you're trying to build something new. If Especially what? not having to build a new supply chain. Like if you can take advantage of parts that are already there. Uh, and then later when you get the scale and the technology is proven and everybody wants more of it, then you make those investments. And that's huge opportunities for more cost reductions or performance improvements because you can direct a supply chain specifically to whatever that is, direct air capture LEDs or whatever it is. So but yeah, if you let, yeah, let's, do that house. Sorry to interrupt, Greg. Let's talk about that supply chain and international supply chains and unpack a bit more the, the, the free flow of ideas, equipment, and people across borders. And I'll start, I'll, I'll give you an example. So in 2015, I put a four kilowatt uh, solar system on my roof in, in a house, cost me for four kilowatts, 14 grand. I did the same in 2017 for another house. It cost me 12 grand. So very quick math, that's a 15% cost decline just in a couple of years. So coming down rapidly. But with that second purchase, my installer said, 
Well, you better get in your order soon because tariffs on imported Chinese panels are about to kick in and you're going to go back up to those 2015 prices. So what do we have right now? We have in Canada a tariff that we put on imported solar panels to basically prop up, uh, and, and I'm going to get, as I always do, some heated emails on this, a Canadian domestic manufacturing sector, which has in many ways been a failure to launch. And insofar as it's very cyclical, it's small, it's very boutique and orders basically were the solar panel manufacturer of last resort. When the U.S. can't get panels from elsewhere, we call on our Canadian manufacturers. They hire a bunch of people, they produce for six months and then quietly they lay them off. And the biggest company in Canada is actually a co company called Canadian Solar, which is a Canadian in name only, where it's really headquartered in China and they've got an outpost here in Canada. So we've got this now shrinking world where we're putting tariffs in, we're impeding the flow of equipment across national borders. We're passing on costs to developers at a time when we need more solar. And if anything, in the last two weeks with what's happening in Ukraine, we're going to see further erosion of the flow of equipment and goods across borders. That's what I worry about. So. Putting it back to the three of you, is that going to then start to bend those cost curves in the wrong direction if we're essentially implementing tariffs and our worlds are getting a lot smaller instead of more globalist? Yeah, I'm not sure it goes like in the long term. I, I don't think you can kind of like reverse the learning curve through tariffs. I don't think we'd want to do that to ourselves. But remember, what we want to do is speed things up. We want to go from an 80 year development cycle to a 20 year development cycle. And I mean, everything that I've seen is like, the more free flow of ideas, of parts, of people, of money, of machines, of final products, the faster we can go. And so if we're slowing things down, possibly for good reasons, like maybe we want to have some domestic manufacturing or we are concerned about human rights in other places where manufacturing has happened. So it, it could be that, that those are choices for other reasons we want, but we should just be aware that a consequence is that slows down the development process, the adoption process is scaling up. And so, yeah, that's my biggest concern about tariffs. It just, it's like putting a break when we need to be putting our foot on the gas to accelerate. Yeah. And, and, and relations between Canada and China are just exceedingly complex. So while you have the development industry coming forward saying, Canada's got a goal, it wants a net zero grid by 2035, putting these tariffs in place to make solar projects more expensive makes no sense. The Canadian government's quick, quick response is, Oh, so you want us to do more business with China? They only just recently released the jailed two Michaels after holding them unjustly for three years. So it's just very, very difficult to get that tariff removed right now. Yeah. But I kind of wonder, though, in the longer term, if this gets uh, becomes less of an issue, because remember, what, what's helpful, what China can do really well is organize a supply chain, source materials from China or from other parts of the world string together equipment that is some of it is domestically made in China. A lot of it is purchased from other places too. And China is just incredibly good for that, at that and incredibly ambitious and has no fear of making more capacity than they really need to make. And I think having that kind of ambition and attitude has led to a lot of the success, a lot of cost reductions. Maybe those conditions don't happen everywhere else, but the machines are available. The expertise is available. The supplies are not unique to China. And so if we think about maybe in Canada, maybe in the U.S., but I'd be more thinking about what about India or Egypt or other places that are rapidly developing that have strong solar resource. Why not do some of the easier to start processes like taking cells and putting them into modules together with glass manufacturing? That type of stuff could start to happen in other places and maybe you don't need to lean on tariffs as much because some of the knowledge um, gets spread around and the machines do as well. And so if I were China, I would actually be more concerned about that than about tariffs um, kind of blocking their exports. I want to pick up for one second. I think one of the things I loved most about your book, Greg, which is really terrific, is, is it really gives some understanding of the way that what made solar cheap was all these little innovations across the supply chain. And although a lot of the production was in China, that was just the final assembly, if you like. But the production supply chain and the machines that make the machines were really spread pretty globally. And just 
despite the enormous effort at places like Harvard and Stanford and MIT and so on, on really fancy new solar technologies, which got a lot of science and nature papers in press, they basically were almost irrelevant. What we did was a bunch of little innovations around the supply chain, which beat down the cost of silicon. Yep. Yeah, and, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And I would just add to that, you know, we've been focused, of course, on the on the module story. You know, the, the cost of solar involves modules and, uh, and other components as well. Module costs, of course, you know, have declined and have been the biggest contributor to the reduction in cost. Uh, but there are still things that we can do domestically, right? Especially if you're talking about, Ed, like the solar on your rooftop, the soft costs and all of the associated costs with actually getting you as a customer and, and doing that install and dealing with the permits and all those kinds of stuff. Um, there's a lot more room now there, you know, especially when you look at the relative costs of the modules and, and the soft costs uh, to continue to increase, uh, or sorry, to continue to de decrease costs uh, by targeting that as well, too. So I think, you know, the cheaper, of course, the panels themselves get in some ways, the less important it is to continue to, you know, get them so much more cheaper. I mean, of course, it always makes everything easier if, if it gets cheaper, but, but there are these different regimes. And I would say for solar, you know, we've come into the regime where the modules are now at a level that like they are competitive and, and it's some of the other pieces that we, uh, you know, might have more to gain on. Totally. Absolutely. And it's also true that, you know, some places that installation part that you're talking about, the soft cost part, there's big differences in that. Like some places do it really badly. Like the US and Japan are really expensive to install solar in those places. But look at a place like Germany and Australia, like half the cost to install the same equipment. And those are not low wage places. They're just places that have figured it out. So yeah, I agree. There's a lot of opportunity there as well. I got one more question and then I want to get to audience Q&A. So you'd mentioned the US, Germany, Japan, Australia, most recently China, and perhaps most significantly China. They've all sort of played past the baton in this journey to make solar cheap. Greg, from your research, is there any policy instrument that would provide kind of like a through line across all those countries and all jurisdictions that have contributed to it? Or has it been a hodgepodge of different policies? I think of um, probably the, the lesson from that is there's a concept that some political scientists use of policy sequencing, where you design a mix of policies that address different parts of the problem and that you don't think about it statically. You don't just think about what do we need to do in 2022? You think, what do we need to do to have millions of tons or tens of millions of tons of direct air capture by 2030. What are the set of policies that go from today to 2030? And with solar, we didn't have that comprehensive plan, but what we did have is different countries trying different things along the way. I think that's what made it work, but I think it's also what made it go so slow is that it wasn't kind of planned as a sequence. It was more, let's focus on the technology now okay, maybe it's time to start to experiment with some new markets. Let's see if consumers will take it up. If we give them rebates, oh yeah, they do. Let's see if we can scale it up. Let's give people certainty for larger investments. That's what Germany did. Let's invest in supply chains. That's what China did. So if we could think about that less kind of experimentally and more in terms of a comprehensive sequence, I think we could, that would be another way to get things to move faster because it's more than one policy. We need different policies at different times. And there's also politics involved with this too, is that some of these policies create new constituencies and beneficiaries of the policies. And that as those start to build and add pressure, maybe then it's easier to create a policy that creates new winners and losers or has imposes costs on some of them. And so that's part of it too, is having interest groups along the way changing as well that affect which policies are feasible and which, um, which weren't before. Great. Okay. Uh, Let's get to audience Q&A. So our first question is from Jory Vermette. Jory, uh, your mic is live. Go ahead. Hey, hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear awesome. you. Awesome. Perfect. So first of all, thank you. This discussion has been awesome. Um, just uh, like a recently new viewer or listener, I guess would be the correct word. So really learned a lot so far. But my question is, uh, on the topic of price with regards to batteries, whether they're made of cobalt or lithium, um, is there a possibility to make them cheap enough within the necessary time frame that, for example, the IPCC report uh, indicates to compete with, for example, more popular forms of energy consumption like light natural gas? Um, how do we make that happen? And then the bonus question would be, how do we make that happen while making it cheaper without significant exploitation of the countries that produce those minerals for the batteries? 
and without banking on the assumption of future technologies that aren't curr- currently existing or currently feasible, like carbon capture storage or uh, something that may make battery technology more efficient or, or cheaper that isn't existing today. So I hope that question made sense. And thank you so much for letting me ask it live. Greg, do you want to take the first crack? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we kind of mentioned before, there's a, a pathway for batteries that looks similar to solar. I mean, if you look at the learning curve so far, it's like the same steepness. It's just earlier on, the markets are really large. The expectation that there will be a market if you can make batteries cheaper and that that's a big and growing market, there's benefits to that that go beyond climate change, like about you know air pollution in cities, for example. So yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that battery technology could get better. It's also similar to solar too. And as David said, there's all these exotic ways to turn photons into a electric flow. And we've tried lots of things, but we're basically doing this design that was kind of came together in 1985, despite all these alternatives. Same with lithium ion for batteries. But I think that also presents this possibility that we could switch to different materials or different combinations of materials and allow us to maybe substitute away from some of the materials that are difficult to extract, polluting to extract, or have human rights issues associated with their extraction. And so increasingly though, that's a big part of it because what we're trying to do is go from today, 1% of vehicles are electric vehicles. They have mainly powered by batteries. And if we need that to go, as you said, to something like 50% or more than that, that's a lot more extraction. So I think, you know, changing that about how we extract and maybe switching the materials uh, is a crucial part of it. But, you know, I, I think that's possible as well, because there's a lot of uh, a science on the, on the different ways that you could uh, store, store energy in, in the vehicle, for example. Great. Okay. I think uh, David, Sarah, and I, are, we're going to hold our discussion because we want to cycle through more questions. So we've got uh, next question coming from Tom Cullen. Welcome and your mic is live. Thanks very much, uh, Greg. Uh, definitely your book's now at the top of my list. Uh, as a longtime advocate for carbon pricing to correct the market failures, um, we've often cited in broad terms that this would um, help fund innovation uh, for renewable energy and so on. Can you cite, and maybe you've done the work uh, already, quantitative studies that uh, we can use when we have discussions with politicians or other people uh, to help demonstrate that this isn't just sort of an obvious thing, but who knows if it's really true versus it really is true. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's two sides of that. So if you price carbon, you've got two things you can do that might help innovation. One is if you're taxing things or selling permits, you're raising revenue and you could devote that revenue to innovation. That's one thing that the European Union emissions trading system has done. They have something called the innovation fund. And so they take 400 million permits. They take the revenues from those permits and that raises billions of dollars and that goes towards funding demonstration projects. So that's one way that carbon pricing can be linked to innovation directly. And, and the EU has kind of worked on that and is, is a second round of doing that program. So that's one I would look at. The second part though, is that does having a price on carbon create a market or a stronger market for these low carbon technologies? And in theory, of course it does. And in practice, the question is how much, and is it strong enough to actually lead to investment? And you know, there's now we've got 15 years of carbon pricing in the EU. And we can look at what's happened and, you know, studies have looked at that. And one thing you see is you see fuel switching. So you do see that, uh, companies that are regulated and have to buy emissions permits, you know, have made investments in efficiency to pollute less. Some have switched from coal to gas. Um, and so there's some outcomes there. Do we actually see that we would, uh, have a new technology? like lithium ion batteries or solar or advanced nuclear start to happen because of a carbon price or an anticipated carbon price there. We just don't have evidence that that's really happened because you really have to have a lot of credibility in the price that the price will be high in the future. And that's something that's been missing. And so maybe that takes time, but we really haven't seen it now. Probably the one though, that I would also point to, if you're looking for evidence is the low carbon fuel standard in California, where you have prices that have been around $200 per ton. And that starts to lead to investment and it doesn't have to be in California. That's another part of that policy. So I think 
Yeah, I, w- I would look at that one as well as as a way in which carbon pricing has had an impact on on innovation. But for solar, it didn't really. It was just uh, you know the, all the solar development happened before carbon pricing became substantial. So just great. Weigh in. Think- oh, good. David, go ahead. I know yeah. I want to weigh in, then Sarah as well. Just to weigh in, for example, a, a central reason that carbon engineering was able to raise any money uh, uh, early on in 2009 was California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. And that was because we weren't doing anything anybody expected. There weren't already incentives for carbon removal because nobody had thought about uh, direct air capture. Uh, but but the whole point was the Low Carbon Fuel Standard was uh, technology neutral, but it had a high price. And that was central to us getting started. Yeah, and the sustained high price of two hundred bucks, and yeah. it's it, because of California's largesse. You don't have to be a regulated entity. You don't have to be based in California. It is the single biggest catalyst, I think, for the development of carbon removal technologies, or specifically direct air capture technologies of anywhere in the world right now. But what I would say, just in, I'm glad we're talking about policy. We jumped over our policy discussion to get to questions. Now we're circling back. Is here in Canada the single biggest enabling? piece of policy that I think we had was Ontario's feed and tariff program, which no longer exists. It it really, if you look at the, the development of solar, was exponential because of it. And yet, when Sarah and I would go in and meet with policymakers in Alberta, they would say one thing consistently, regardless of political stripe, we're not going to do what Ontario did because it involved, as successful as it was, a very status approach with bureaucrats setting electricity prices some of which were over generous and created some market distortions. But really, if you, I, we've got so many policies even right now in this country. I was just on a call around the investment tax credit for renewables. We have a program that invests directly in utility scale solar and wind projects, especially with storage. We have a to be unveiled clean electricity standard. We don't know what it is, just it was in a platform. Could we not just get at everything and drive the technology deployment that we want with one stiff carbon price? We have that. It just isn't stiff enough. Instead of creating this big stack of pancakes, which is the pr- political reality of, of what we have today. Sorry, that's my, my little diatribe. Sarah, over to you. Then we'll get to one last question. Yeah, well, maybe I'll pick up on that, Ed. I mean, I think sitting in Canada, we have something that the U.S. doesn't, right? That we have a carbon price. And and I would argue that one of the things, though, that we lack is that price certainty or the high enough price, whether it's, you know, the price today or the price in the future. Um, and so I think that would, you know, when you talk about carbon price being able to drive innovation, it's going to you need different policies along the innovation curve, right? And so early stage innovation is probably not going to be driven very much by carbon pricing. Um, But as you get to that later stage, you know, I think we are very much caught when it comes to CCS, for example, in this state now where, you know, the carbon price that we're going to have in theory would be high enough to make some of these projects economic, but there isn't, uh, you know, that the financial markets are not sufficiently certain around that price. Um, And so that's where I think that policies, you know, could be used. To, to bring that price certainty forwards um, and help make that price more, uh, you know, more, more bankable today. Um, Ed, just picking up also on the Ontario story that you told, I mean, I think that's another great example where the the experience in Ontario, I would cl- classify that as a mix of really electricity and decarbonization policy, but also really industrial and domestic manufacturing policy, right? And part of the reason that those costs were higher in Ontario was because of the decision to require uh, local content and local manufacturing, which as, you know, Greg mentioned, um, you know, you may be paying more than for that product. We can debate whether that's good policy or not. You know, I think it depends a lot on what you want to see happen with your local uh, with your with your domestic manufacturing capabilities. But I think that's one example where it's important and where the policy space gets so messy because the tools that you're using, depending on you know what you're trying to achieve and the ultimate cost of those tools are going to be really different if your goal is just carbon reduction or if it is you know broader economic development skills. So just to kind of yeah. note on that. And usually bureaucrats, my, my lesson is they have difficulty doing the two at the same time. They can do industrial development, They can do environmental policy. They have a real tough time coupling them. All right, we're going to get to one more question. Thank you for your patience. Uh, We're going to Karen Spencer. Okay, you can hear me there? We sure can, Karen. Okay, awesome. Um, So my question takes us back to maybe the very beginning of the discussion. Uh, With all the uncertainty in Europe, 
And I was just uh, looking at Germany's actions. They've decommissioned many of their nuclear power plants in the past year or two. Uh, and uh, of course, have, I think, the last few shutting down here shortly if they didn't just do it already. And so I wondered with their uh, putting a halt to the current construction, I believe, and approvals on the main gas line coming from Russia, what are your comments on potentially reversing some of those decisions? You know, given the need for the large predictable base energy volume that they have over there. I could. The, okay. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that, you know, that German decision on nuclear power is rooted in like the 1968 protest movement. So there's a lot of history behind that. They've already, that's already been through a couple of oil crises. And now we've got uh, in another gas crisis in 2006 or seven or eight, it was. So yeah, I think there's potential for that to get reversed again, but hard to predict at this point um, where it's going to go. And, you know, there's lots of different voices in Germany, especially about whether they should go, you know, all in on renewables, for example, others that want to keep the nuclear uh, option alive. And yeah, so we'll, we'll see on that one, I think. Yeah, I think there has been some, you know, uh, comments made by parts of government that have been historically against uh, or sort of for the shutdown of nuclear plants, saying that they're willing to, you know, consider keeping them open just for that reason. And so I think it sort of comes back to that point that we were discussing in the beginning that, you know, a real crisis uh, creates a focusing event and people are willing to touch potential solutions or discuss solutions that they may have been completely unwilling to do uh, in previous uh, previous times. There, there's four gigawatts operating still, if I've got the numbers right, and they're scheduled to be shut down this year. And that's the latest number I saw. And my read from Germans is they might still do it, but maybe they'll push it out another year. I think it was crazy to shut them down, but obviously I'm not a German voter. And, and let's say, let's also think of Japan and its catalyst being the Fukushima crisis from triggered by the tsunami in, in 2012. And even back then, I think they only had two of 55 units that were operating and they took those two offline only to bring units back online because they needed the power. And now I think they've decided to take remaining units permanently offline. I'm, I, I'm not aware of the timeline for it. It's a good reminder, I think, that when we look at all these energy models and what should happen and what the lowest costs are and all these things that, you know, we have energy systems that very much live in the world of humans that are making decisions. Uh, we can say they're not rational or maybe they're rational within the, the world that we live in, but uh, it, it's it's messy. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah and, and being married to a Japanese woman, I've family that post Fukushima went and, and helped out with some of the, the rebuilding and recovery efforts. And so it's hard for me to tell them on a rational basis, but you need that nuclear power compared to the alternatives. They said, well, you weren't there helping us rebuild these towns. Okay. We're going to leave it at that. We've gone a bit over time. Thanks to everyone for hanging in. Um, listen, Greg, Greg Nemet, a big thank you to you. This is the second time in the last six months that I've monopolized an hour of your time. Uh, we're really grateful. Uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, yeah, you were a terrific guest today. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Enjoy the discussion with all of you. Thanks, Greg. Right. A reminder that this episode is going to be available at energyversusclimate.com for later listening. And as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen, don't forget to rate us, please. Our next episode is going to drop in mid-March, precise date TBD. David, Sarah, and I are going to do a dive into the energy and climate dimensions of crypto and experiment with drinking and recording at the same time. Um, we'll, <laughs> and we'll betting. A, yes, yes. We'll have a, a few surprises, including the news that now we're becoming budding crypto investors as a learning experience as part of this. So, Some of us. <laughs> Oh, some of us. Oh, you're going to give way. You're going to give way. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on Sarah. We've got some Dogecoin lined up for her. <laughs> uh, give us feedback at energyversusclimate at gmail.com, or I should say now, let me take that back, info <laughs> at energyversusclimate.com. You can support us at energyversusclimate.com. You think I could say that by now? And we'll see everyone next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to Energy vs. Climate. The show is created by David Keith, Sarah Hasing Simon, and me, Ed Whittingham, and produced by Eva Voinijescu. Mika McFarlane, Crystal Hickey, and Christina Pearson provide support. 
Our title and show music is The Windup by Brian Lips. Sign up for updates and exclusive webinar access at energyversusclimate.com. Interact with us live every other week and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen.